got a, there's more to say about Citizens United. Um, I'm sure you noticed that in Justice Kennedy's analysis that depends so heavily on his concept that the First Amendment protects speech regardless of the identity of the speaker. He acknowledged that uh, there are some categories of real people, live human beings, whose speech, um, even political speech, uh, can be restricted by government. And he pointed, for example, to um, high school students, as in the Blomkitz case, Morris versus Frederick, where the court consistently has viewed student speech, even students' political speech, as entitled to less protection than the speech of adults. Uh, then there's the speech of prisoners, another disfavored category of citizens, of speakers, who certainly don't have full First Amendment rights, including for political speech. Uh, and then there are people in the military whose speech can be and is restricted by government. And finally, uh, the category of government employees uh, who do not have the right to express their political views as fully as people who are not uh, government employees. Uh, Justice Kennedy attempts to justify treating corporations as having full-blown political speech rights, but not these categories of real people, on the ground that the institutions involved with high school students and military and so on couldn't operate effectively, couldn't carry out their mission if the people who want to speak were allowed to. Uh, I didn't find that terribly convincing, um, but tuck that one away as we consider uh, later in the course some of these disfavored uh, categories of speakers. We already talked about school children, we talked about prisoners uh, later on. What about the practical effect of the Citizens United case? Um, there's a lot of ink being spilled on that subject. Um, and you remember at the State of the Union speech um, two years ago, right after the decision, just days after the decision, uh, President Obama goes to Congress for his annual State of the Union speech. By the way, how many of you saw the State of the Union speech last week? Wow, amazing, good. And the rest of you were too busy rereading for the third time the Citizens United case. Uh, well, that's a decent excuse. Um, but anyway, uh, Obama appears before the Congress and says that what the, you know, the, I think seven of the Supreme Court justices were right here, right in front of him. He's up on the podium, and he scolds the court, saying that the court reversed a century of law that I believe will open the floodgates for special interests, including foreign corporations, to spend without limit in our elections. And Justice uh, Alito was uh, sitting among the group and w was seen to, he's here, looking, looking very unhappy, uh, was seen to mutter, not true. He mouthed, not true. And in fact, Obama didn't have it um, quite right. It's not true that the court reversed a century of law. Uh, all the court reversed were the two decisions in the last couple of decades, and it did not invalidate restrictions on corporate contributions. That is, corporations before Citizens United and today are not allowed to contribute directly to candidates' campaigns. Um, and the court, in Justice Kennedy's opinion, expressly left open whether Congress can limit spending by foreign-controlled corporations. So the court did not decide that foreign corporations can um, get involved in, in American elections. Um, the practical effect of the decision, I think, um, we're not entirely clear where we'll be when the dust settles, but the first tryout, of course, was the midterm elections in 2010, after the decision took effect. Uh, and it was um, expected, I suppose, that corporations would do what Citizens United expressly allowed them to do, that is, take out ads with their own independent money supporting or opposing a candidate. And they didn't do it at all. I've never seen one, I've never heard of one. Can you imagine that uh, Exxon, for example, or the Bank of America would take out an ad oppose, say, opposing a Senator Boxer in California? And, and at the end of it, the voiceover would say, I'm Herman Schwartz, the CEO of the Bank of America. That isn't his name. I don't know who it is. The, the CEO of the Bank of America, and I approve this message. Corporations are not going to do that because they would instantly alienate half of their customers, the, the half, at least half, who would be offended by a corporation taking a side against their candidate. So the, the very right that Citizens United uh, liberated corporations to exercise, they ignored. They didn't do that at all. Instead, what happened in the 2010 elections uh, was that corporations gave a lot of money to nonprofit advocacy groups like the United States Chamber of Commerce and Karl Rove's Crossroads GPS organization, which he set up specifically for this occasion, uh, and the corporations could give their money to these organizations who would then take out the ads, and the corporations didn't have to be disclosed. Their contributions to these nonprofits didn't have to be disclosed. Uh, and a lot of money flooded into the 2010 elections in that form. Um, it's not clear to me uh, whether Citizens United had any effect on that phenomenon at all. I think that before Citizens United, corporations could have donated to these nonprofit uh, advocacy organizations, uh, and then they did so afterwards. Uh, I don't think that's because of Citizens United, except to the extent that the decision in Citizens United was a psychological or political or sociological, a societal phenomenon that sent out the signal to everybody that corporations can now spend their money on political campaigns. Um, and so they, well, how are we going to do that? And this vehicle through uh, nonprofits became available. But now what we're seeing is the use of super PACs. Um, political action committees uh, set up and um, receiving millions and millions of dollars and now in the primary elections, in the Republican primary elections, the uh, super PACs, there seems to be one for each candidate, 
I mean, Mitt Romney has his, that they all have euphemistic names that don't identify the candidate in the name of the organization. Restore Our Future, I think, is up his Romney. Gingrich has one, they all have one. And those super PACs, those political action committees, are outspending the candidates' own campaigns. And the restriction on them is that, on super PACs, is that they can't coordinate with the actual candidate's campaign. They can't say, well, you, know, you, you take South Carolina and we'll take Florida, uh, and we're going to run all negative ads against uh, Gingrich in, in Florida, and so on. Uh, they can't have that conversation. But they don't need to have that conversation because the super PACs are organized and run by the insiders from those candidates' campaigns, the former campaign managers, and, and so on, who are running. They don't need to have those conversations. Uh, and I, I think the existence of these super PACs is uh, certainly going to be a major, major uh, factor in this year's presidential election. President Obama has his own super PAC. It's not a partisan issue. Uh, and it uh, threatens to flood the election this year with money on both sides. Well, if you think this is a bad situation, uh, then the question is, what can we do about it at this stage? Uh, the court in the Citizens United case upheld the disclosure requirements of the, um, of the law that prohibited corporations from spending their money on political ads, so that if a corporation does that, uh, the ads have to identify on, on screen who funded it. The name has to appear for at least four seconds, which is long enough uh, to get the message across. Uh, and if uh, a, a sponsor of an ad spends more than $10,000 a year, which is nothing, um, they have to file a report with the FEC, the Federal Election Commission. Uh, the court, over the dissent of Justice Thomas, uh, upheld the disclosure requirements. Justice Thomas, using the, um, what he called the harassment of these donors to the pro-Proposition 8, the same-sex marriage proposition in California, um, when they were disclosed, uh, some of them were harassed, and Justice Thomas said that is an impermissible burden on the free speech of the people who want to donate to a uh, political campaign like that. He was the only one uh, who took that position, and eight to one, the court upholds the disclosure requirement. Well, the disclosure requirement could be greatly improved. Um, and for example, to take the super PACs uh, as an example, uh, they can choose whether to report to the, they do have to disclose their contributors, the super PACs do, unlike the nonprofit advocacy organization. Um, but they can choose whether to report quarterly or monthly. And in some situations, like in these primaries, they don't have to report until after the election's over. So the disclosure requirement there is not very useful. Uh, and in the internet age, and Justice Kennedy refers to this, um, there's the possibility, at least, of real-time, immediate disclosure of contributions. Uh, and uh, that might make a difference if everybody knew right when it happened that a corporation had made a donation to a particular um, super PAC. Um, the Congress attempted to pass a statute in 2010 called the Disclose Act. I don't remember what the acronym stood for, but it was about beefed-up disclosure requirements. Um, and the act did not pass before the Congress uh, went home. Justice Stevens suggested in his dissent in Citizens United that we might, um, you might lean on the states uh, all corporations are chartered by states, they're not federal corporations, uh, and uh, every state can charter corporations, and they're governed creatures of state law. So states could impose requirements on their corporations, requiring, for example, that before a corporation made any uh, political contribution, that it be approved by a majority of the shareholders, which would be a real barrier um, to corporate contributions, because at least slow them down in some respect. Um, and then, right from the get-go, people have suggested there ought to be a constitutional amendment to deal with these corporations as persons uh, with free speech rights able to overwhelm uh, real people's voice in elections. Uh, and because Citizens United was a constitutional decision, an interpretation of the First Amendment, Congress can't overturn it. The Constitution means what the Supreme Court says it means. Congress can't overturn a constitutional decision of the court, so there has to be an amendment. And various people have talked about putting together amendments. I found uh, two. You don't often see the language that people are proposing when they're saying, we're going to amend the Constitution. Um, one of them was introduced uh, in the last few weeks by Senator Bernie Sanders from Vermont. And I don't know what you think about it. I mean, it would be the 28th Amendment to the United States Constitution. We haven't had a zillion of them. Like, we amend the California Constitution every other year, it seems like. Uh, and the California Constitution is about that thick. Well, there's zillions of amendments and so on compared to the thin uh, United States Constitution. But uh, Sanders' amendment says that the rights protected by the Constitution of the United States are the rights of natural persons and do not extend to for-profit corporations. Um, and then it goes on in section two to say that all these corporations are subject to regulation. Uh, section three, that these corporations are prohibited from making contributions or expenditures in any election of candidate for public office or ballot measures, which would be relevant in California. And then authorizes Congress and the states to regulate all election contributions and expenditures. That would wipe, wipe away uh, Buckley versus Faleo, the first big campaign decision, and certainly uh, wipe away Citizens United. How do you like this one? Is this a good solution to the problem? We don't think it's a problem. No way. It, uh, it, does not, um, it does not cover nonprofits. In other words, uh, it says that these rights do not extend to for-profit corporations. It prohibits for-profit corporations only. Yeah, it does not touch the, the Karl Rove Chamber of Commerce phenomenon at all. That would go on business as usual under this amendment. Right?
for business purposes. Yeah, maybe, maybe somebody would argue that that covers these nonprofits who are promoting business interests. Uh, didn't work very much and then parts of it have been struck down in Citizens United. Yeah, and you kind of want, you have to, it, I'm not a big fan of tinkering with the Constitution, uh, proposing amendments to the Constitution. Because you start that process and then people are going to want to hang all kinds of ornaments on that tree, especially if you're dealing with First Amendment thing, that people are going to want prayer in the schools and they're going to want um, no abortions and, and all kinds of stuff that are going to get involved in the amendment process once that Pandora's box is open. Um, so you wonder about the collateral mischief that might come from, a, uh, from a, an amendment like this. This says that the rights protected, the right, not First Amendment rights, not just election rights, but the rights protected by the Constitution don't extend to for-profit corporations at all. Well, that includes due process and equal protection. So that, um, theoretically, a state could say um, only corporations that are uh, run by registered Democrats will be allowed to operate in the state. And that doesn't deny corporations any constitutional rights, because they don't have any. Yeah. You know, I think they don't have Fourth Amendment search and seizure rights as corporations anyway, but the individuals do. The executives of the, uh, of the corporation do. And Sanders' amendment doesn't apply to unions at all. Remember, the law that was invalidated in Citizens United applied to both equally, to both corporations and unions. So this, will be met, uh, this proposal will be met with a loud opposition from the corporate community saying, look, you're tilting the scales totally. Unions aren't bound by this at all. Only us. Tina? Yeah, uh, this doesn't speak... Well, it does too. Uh, uh, they can regulate, but... Uh, not to limit freedom of the press. I don't, I don't know what that's going to mean. I mean, that invites litigation about what happens to media corporations. I know there's another um, uh, People's Rights Amendment that has been introduced. Uh, Representative uh, Jim McGovern from Massachusetts introduced it. And it's, 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 we intend the rights protected by the Constitution to be the rights of natural persons. Well, yeah, we intend that, but what is this, what, where does it actually bite? And then the operative provision, the words people, person, as used in this Constitution, does not include corporations. And they're all subject to regulation and so on. Uh, so this cures the nonprofit problem, because nonprofits will be disabled by this provision as well as for-profit corporations, but it doesn't mention unions. Um, and it has the same mischief-making uh, possibilities uh, as the other amendment, in that you're gonna, if you, this one really does deny corporate personhood, takes away corporate personhood. Well, what does that mean? The, the corporations can't be sued as persons. You have to sue the individual people in the corporation. Uh, the corporations can't own property or sell property as they're legal persons. Um, there's a lot of questions that either of these proposed amendments would um, have to deal with. John? So, say if, uh, you know, say, if, you know, just say Bill Gates wanted to give a bunch of money to the Obama and, 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 and it had nothing to do with this company, Donald Trump just owned the account, mm -hmm. um, and he put up a, you know, put up a, an interview online saying, this is why I want to give money to the campaign for my own personal reasons. Would that still be considered a corporation? No, no, no. He, 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 Bill Gates as an individual can't contribute directly to uh, a candidate's campaign, unlike Microsoft, which can't, but it's limited to $2,500. Per election, so if it's a primary, you get five primary plus election five thousand dollars. That's what Bill Gates can give. I'll never miss it. Um, <laughs> if I were advising Bill Gates on wanting to support Obama, I, I would welcome his support, um, and I would say, why don't you give a lot of money to Obama's super PAC, where there's no limitation, like uh, the casino owner from Las Vegas, Sheldon Adelson. He and his wife just put ten million dollars into um, Gingrich's super PAC. There's no limitation, but they can't co coordinate with the candidate campaign. Yeah. I wish I knew. You know, uh, it's really hard to find out the ins and outs of this. And you know, I think some astute lawyers, one Citizens United came down, who were campaign insiders, tried to figure out how to exploit it. And super PACs was the idea that they came up with. Um, but why not use those nonprofit corporations? Well, the corporations are nonprofit corporations who are advocacy organizations, and that would include the ACLU and the CR Club and so on. They're corporations, um, and they don't have to disclose their contributors. It's like the NAACP. It was a case that went to the Supreme Court decades ago, where the state of Alabama tried to force try to get the NAACP out of the state during the civil rights movement uh, and uh, tried to force disclosure of the NAACP membership and donors. And